Well, I think we can see uh, Emma as a kind of female Quixote. She, too, is formed by these prior scripts, scripts that effectively serve as lenses on the world that are the way she sees the world. This, too, is not a happy notion, it seems to me. We would like to think of our own subjectivity as something that is free and spontaneous, but what this suggests is that we are always schooled, schooled in ways that have nothing to do with the schools that we go to, our formal education, but schooled in the sense that we have either read or internalized certain kinds of doctrines, certain kinds of stories, and that they, to our, we, we have no control over this, no awareness of it, but they nonetheless, inside of us, shape and govern how we feel. What did she read? She read sentimental fiction. She read about the religious hunger for bliss, for ecstatic states. She read about knights. She read about heroes. She read about languishing maidens. She read a lot about swooning with happiness. Well, that's how she comes out of the convent. She lives on a farm with her fairly well-to-do father, farmer, and she imagines that marriage for her is going to be, of course, the grand consummation of these dreams. She, in fact, had wanted to be married by torch ceremony at midnight. Instead, it's a huge instead. Instead, she is fated to marry the widowed country doctor, Charles Bovary. There's very little in fiction, it seems to me, that is as rigorous as Flaubert's account of Charles Bovary. In fact, the novel starts with Charles Bovary, and I'm pronouncing him in the French way because he goes into school as a child and they ask him his name. He says, Charles Bovary, and they think it's just one word. They don't know what it means even. And there's a long description of his bumblingness in school, and it's a bumblingness and a kind of gaucheness that never leaves him. Well, you can see that this could really be a, a misalliance, a really bad couple, and it's exactly what's going to happen, that to be married to this man who has absolutely not a scrap of romance in him, even though he worships Emma, given the needs and given the expectations, which she does not think of at all as exaggerated, that she has for what life is supposed to give her, in particular marriage is supposed to give her, we've got a bad, bad situation on our hands. And it allows Flaubert to write a critique of marriage itself as the death of romance, marriage itself as the inexorable experience of routine and boredom, or what the French call ennui. I'd like to read you one or two passages about Charles to give you a sense of just how incisive and brutal Flaubert can be uh, in nailing this character. Charles's conversation was commonplace as a street pavement, and everyone's ideas trooped through it in their everyday garb without exciting emotion, laughter, or thought. That may seem like a mundane phrase, but not many of us could come up with that phrase. His conversation was commonplace as a street pavement. Commonplace. Commonplace is an interesting term here because Charles is common. Common almost in the etymological sense that everybody else's ideas are his. That's what it means here. Their ideas troop through it in their everyday garb. There's nothing original about him. It's an insidious remark because I think the reader has to begin to wonder, well, is this just a critique of Charles? Or is, in fact, this a comment about human beings, that all of us are a kind of reservoir of commonplaces, of cliches, of things that have come through us? Are all of us like street pavement in that sense that everybody else's ideas troop through? Not a particularly nice notion. Well, that view of Charles, of course, leads to further accounts of their life together. And Flaubert is famous in this book for the depictions of their married existence. He doesn't go into the bedroom it, because that's not where the action is for him. Instead, he goes to the sort of routine events that all married people know about, which has to do, for example, with eating a meal. I'll read you a passage about this, and I want you to hear how much is packed into this. But it was above all the mealtimes that were unbearable to her. In this small room on the ground floor with its smoking stove, its creaking door, the walls that sweated the damp pavement, all the bitterness of life seemed served up on her plate. 
and with the smoke of the boiled beef there rose from her secret soul waves of nauseous disgust. Charles was a slow eater. She played with a few nuts, or leaning on her elbow amused herself, drawing lines along the oilcloth table clover with the point of her knife. 